There we go. <laughs> All right, now today, what I would like to do is look at a couple of the annotated bibliographies and just talk about some of the issues that I've seen. And these were all turned in a month ago and I, I just finished grading everything. We have a good solid month before the end of the term. The issues that I've seen that need to be addressed are ones that are really easy to fix. And um, and I, I just pointed out, they, they do mean a hefty drop in points, but if you fix them and turn it back in, that's that'll be just fine. And so we'll go over a couple of those. I also wanted to look at a couple of the, um, we have two more critiques turned in that I want to look at and remind everybody, go ahead and you know, get those done right away because you do have extra credit points for the next week or so if you get those done. And the two we're going to see, there's a little bit of an editing issue, but the person who turned them in is taking care of that and they'll, they'll resubmit them so it won't be a problem. But at the very least, I think we can listen to what's going on while we're looking at the image. I, I think you know, so we can we can hear what the critique is. I also wanted to look at a couple of people's ready-mades that were turned in. Uh, so just a couple of things. If you're missing points on the ready-made, it's usually because maybe the, the, the photograph really didn't follow through with the, the ready-made thing we were talking about. And somebody turned in one that I thought was a really interesting take on it. It's interesting enough that it's not what we're expecting, but I, I think you'll agree it's, it's pretty fascinating. And then I also wanted to look at uh, some of the wrapped objects and, and just uh, critique them. We're, we're probably not going to read everything. I think that may take too long, but um, it'll, we'll have an opportunity to at least look at the stuff. So does that sound all right with you guys? Whether or not it sounds all right. OK, OK. I was going to say whether or not it sounds all right, I think that's what I'm going to be doing anyway. So I'm glad you think it's OK. <laughs> so let's see. I am just finding. And uh, Diana, it was really nice to see what you'd been knitting on for the last three classes. So the last three classes, it has not been just that. That was only the last class. Um, otherwise, I'm usually working on another project just because I need to keep my hands busy. Otherwise, I'll fall asleep. <laughs> right. OK, what I'm, what I'm doing is you're going to see the whole screen, but I just want to show you the annotated bibliography. And I'm going to point out what's right. There's um, several of them. I want to show you one where everything is just was done just right. And then we're just going to look at a couple others that uh, need some editing and some work. So let me get this ready. All right, I think that this is good. All right. So let me show you this first one is one that is done just right. And then we're just going to look at a couple others that need a, a few things touched touched up. So if I'm, I'm not picking on anybody, I'm just using this as an example. Uh, remember that at any point up to when finals, the week finals week starts, you guys can resubmit stuff and get, still get full points if you're missing any. All right. Now, one thing I want you to see about this is if we look at each of these. Each of these has two paragraphs, each of these citations. The citations are done according to MLA standard and they're alphabetical. 
And then also each citation has this accessed on phrase. In this case, the person is formatted as accessed day, month, year. And this is exactly what we need for each citation. What I have found is that the single most common issues are first, the five citations aren't in alphabetical order. That is like the most common thing. Second is there is um, many people will have the accessed on phrase on one of the citations, but not on the others. Like for example, this one is missing the one right here. And even though these two are alphabetically arranged, dohosa, dohosa, colon, rubbing, loving, this next one, dohosa, if since this is the exact same as that very first one, it needs to be closer to it. And the next uh, entry line starts with an E. So we go up to the top here, that would be the, the next entry, it starts with an A on this one. So this entry, dohosa dot uh, with a period, then edited by this entry should be in between these two entries. And then um, the third, so, that, so that's the two most common ones is not in alphabetical order and forgetting the accessed on phrase on each citation. And then the, the third most common is that sometimes they're, you know, like this is perfect with the two paragraphs. And then this only has one paragraph. So for full points, you need two paragraphs. First one is a summary of the source, and the second one is your comments on the source. And then uh, I think other than that, it, there, it would be perfect. So again, the three most common issues why people are losing points is first, the citations are not in alphabetical order. Second, each citation needs the accessed on phrase and it can say accessed on then the date or accessed then the date as long as each of those phrases for each citation are the same format. And then the third most common is some people uh, put the two paragraphs into one gigantic paragraph, it needs to be formatted exactly like this example here, where you have the paragraph, the first paragraph is a summary, and the second paragraph is what you think about it. All right, so th does that make sense? We are one of you guys doing the service learning? Or are both of you doing the citations, the research? I'm doing the service learning. You're doing the service learning? OK. Then um, for Diana, th does that make sense how th that's formatted? Yeah, it does. I just didn't realize when I first turned it in, it missed the access on phrase because I used like a kind of like a generator um, type of thing. And on some of them, it did have the access on. And then I just didn't recheck that all of them had it. So. But yes, I do get it. OK. Yeah, the, I love the generators. If anybody is doing this and you have not found a generator, look up MLA Citation Generator. And it saves so much headache. When you do it, though, remember to make sure that there's the access on phrase. Because some of these generators will automatically put that in, some of them won't. And, but most of them also will all give you the option for um, putting that phrase in yourself. Uh, it just depends. But there are do literally dozens of free ones. So again, for the annotated bibliography, if you're missing points, that's those are the three main reasons why. Just go back in, fix it, resubmit it, and you'll get perfect points. Your parents will love you again, and the world will be rosy. All right, uh, Paula, how have you been? How are you doing on your uh, service learning? Has it? A lot of people have had a really big challenge with getting people to respond to them, coordinate with them, and work with them. 
which doesn't make any sense to me because you're going out of the way to help them. Have you had that problem at all, or are you having a pretty good uh, experience with your service lining? Um, I've been having a pretty good experience. I actually um, went and did like one of the bigger parts of it on Monday. So, yeah, but I haven't had any issues with people responding now. Oh, good. Would Would you mind telling us a little bit about what you're doing with your service learning? Um. Yes. Um. I've said before I'm doing. Um. I'm helping this program at Salt Lake Community College that helps with underrepresented students. Um, the program is ran mostly by peer mentors, just students wanting to help out. Um, right. I remember so, you telling me about that. Yeah. Yeah. So everything in the program is limited to the skills that they have. Um, so I've mainly been teaching them some of my skills, I guess. Um, and I've also been making things so that they can teach it to any students that may need it. Um, Cause part of it is also if any student in the program needs help with their homework, the peer mentors help as well. And, <laughs> you know, if a graphic design student comes along then I might help them. Uh -huh. um, but yeah, um, on Monday I help them create some content for their social medias and their website um, and I also like taught them how I was doing everything along the way um, so they could do it in the future and so they oh, could show wow. it to future peer mentors as well so yeah that's pretty cool so it was more than just showing um, it was more than just doing it for them you didn't you weren't doing that you were guiding them in the whole process yeah kind of taking peeling back the curtain so to speak yeah, um, I try to simplify it for them as much as possible. Um, since I know like those skills can take like a while to like learn. So I just kind of try to simplify it as much as I could so that they could at least get started with any of it. So, yeah. That sounds really good. I'm, I'm glad you're doing it. That's great. In In the process, what was the most eye-opening uh, part of the whole thing for you as you were moving forward? Was it, for a lot of people, it's just finding out what's needed because sometimes it's very different than what people expect. Um, yeah, I think, yeah, because originally I was thinking of doing something to help um, the actual students in the program. Um, but we didn't really know what to do. And then we realized that that was something that they needed was to just gain some of the skills that I already had. So. Oh, okay. Yeah. But that, that's really cool. I, that video that I have everybody watch is always impacts me when you see like all the donated supplies put on a beach and burned because people have no idea what to do. So, but it, it, it makes a lot it makes a huge difference finding out what they need and being able to do it. So that's great. Thank you very much. That, that's awesome. Now I am going to share you uh, share this with you. I, it'll just take me a, a short minute or two here. We have two critiques that were turned in that I, I want to share with you. We're going to look at the image and then we are going to uh, listen. Let's see, you know, I'm I'm scowling because I, I have to move things around just a little bit. There we go. Okay. So thank you for talking about that, Paula. I appreciate that because I I did not t ask Paula beforehand. I just put her on the spot. So thank you. Okay, I am going to go ahead and uh, show this this critique on this this one is one that we're having a little bit of hard time singing the sound with the critique but that'll be taken care of and what we are going to do is i'm going to show you the image then i'm going to play the sound okay you guys ready
My name is Diana Morillo, and I will be doing a self critique of the structure with skin assignment. For the description portion of this critique, I will start by saying that this artist has created a structure mainly with triangles as the main building blocks or nodules. I also see that the artist has used um, very neutral, however, quite pleasing colors in its composition. Um, I also see that the object appears to be pretty sturdy, able to stand on its own, and it is able to um, be its own piece. I also see that the artist has used spikes or sticks um, that are upright and very um, straight in order to add interest and more variation among the triangles in this structure. Furthermore, I estimate that it looks to be about five inches in width, um, maybe six to seven inches in depth, and roughly eight to nine inches in height. Um, we may be adding another inch or two with like the tallest point in the structure. I also believe that the artist may have chosen the colors very deliberately for this assignment, making sure that they all um, correspond with each other and mirror each other in certain places. For the analysis portion of this assignment, I will say that the artist has chosen wood as their main material choice that appears. Um, I see mostly straight lines used by popsicle sticks or skewers. These spikes are formed by even uh, the points of the skewers and then other smaller portions of skewers are used to connect the triangles or the nodules. The nodules are also created by two different triangles, um, maybe isosceles triangles if we're looking at these so two equal sides and one longer side um, and then they are connected by skewers or popsicle sticks to create an almost 3D form. The skin portion of this structure it appears to be um, a very thin paper material so light is easily able to pass through the different triangles and the paper material does seem to differ however complement each other it may be some maybe like Japanese style type of print paper or um, origami paper. They also seem to be glued together pretty deliberately and the small variations in each paper and um, thicker strands versus thinner strands add a lot of interest to this, this structure. And for the interpretation portion of this critique, I do believe the artist is mainly trying to depict movement among a very stable form. The triangle being one of the most stable forms in geometry. However, they have all been moved or tilted with only the beginning front and back triangles being completely upright and stable on the ground. However, all the other triangles are um, in various stages of back and forth and moving through. So this, although it is a very stable form, the artist appears to be trying to create movement from stability and chaos from um, from stability as well. Furthermore, the spikes also add an element of danger or um, a sense of like, do not touch this type of feeling. The artist also um, seems to be warning people off from the structure. And I also believe that the artist has created a very curious shape. So the viewer is forced or not forced, but more um, led to be curious about the form itself. The um, artist seems to be very conscious of where all the triangles intersect, creating even smaller forms within each triangle. So it becomes a visually appealing piece. And for the evaluation of this assignment, I think it actually is pretty successful um, in terms of the assignment bounds. So the there has been several nodules created um, in the same shape and made to create a full structure and then the skin fully complements the nodules however it does not overpower it so both the skin and the structure are equally important and finally the artist has also chosen to add interest and variation within the triangles in the way of which they are formed how they are laying down um, overall i do think this is a successful structure with skin assignment all right, nicely done. I, I think that's that's really well done. What do both of you guys think? Now, um, 
I think if it's okay, Paula, if you can respond to that first, because it is Diana's piece that she's talking about. So Paula, if you wouldn't mind saying what you think about it, and then Diana, I would like you to comment about what you learned about your own piece by critiquing it that way. Um, do you want my opinion on the critique or the work? Yes. Sorry. Yeah. Your, your opinion on the critique. Oh, um, mm, I think the main noticeable thing um, there were no pauses, um, just straight to each point. Um, so yeah, um, I think that was good. Like, I don't think there was any like time wasted in there. Yeah, I noticed that too. It almost sounded like uh, Diana had talking points laid out and it, it just came across really smooth is what I thought. Thank you, Paula. How about, uh, so Diana, is that what you did? Did you have, did you write down what you wanted to talk about beforehand, kind of uh, as an outline and then uh, go through it? Yeah, so I kind of like wrote it out several times and then I did practice beforehand. Um, one of the reasons that I got stuck towards the end is because I couldn't read my own handwriting, but <laughs> I did kind of like write everything down first. All right, good. Now, I, I do want to ask you, since you, you're doing your own critique, did you learn anything about your own work? I did. I realized that I actually put a lot more thought into it than I thought I did. Um, because usually with projects, I kind of just go into it. Like um, if you've noticed with my work logs, I just start and then I don't stop until I'm done. But I'm not like, I guess, actively thinking about it while I'm doing it until I'm like actually looking at it at the end. And I'm like, well, I actually did think about this because if I didn't, then it wouldn't work. That type of right. thing. Yeah. And that, that's something that I really like seeing with this, with um, you guys when you critique your own work and you separate yourself from the work and you just critique it like it's a, some, something belonging to a stranger because as artists we are so hyper self-critical we are perfectionists that cripple our own activity because we're so terrified of screwing up and what i want you guys to realize is that you are really pretty good i mean if you sucked you wouldn't be this far along in the program you wouldn't still be going to school. And uh, I think that the self-critique, when you're honest about it, helps you to, to see how good you are. So, you know, that another plug in, I'm looking forward to seeing everybody else's uh, self-critiques. We have about 16 left for people to do. And uh, it just, I like seeing you guys recognize how amazing you are in your own stuff. So please um, continue and do those. All right, we are going to look at another one, same kind of thing. I, and you guys were able to see the art, right? You saw the page? Yep, everything showed up on my screen. Okay. Good. All right, so here we are. This is for Megan's Textured Cubes. And we're going to listen to this critique. My name is Diana Morillo, and I will be doing a peer critique for the texture and light assignment. This one will be by Megan Durant. For the description portion of this critique, I will start with the texture um, cubes. So on the leftmost side of both of these pictures is the texture cubes. This artist seems to have been playing around with actual texture, so texture that can actually be felt as well as seen. These are both visually and also most likely tactile in interest for the texture portion and on the rightmost side of both pictures this artist has been choosing to display color and um, to explore color in different patterns um, i believe this artist has chosen analogous complementary and monochrome color structures or color profiles for this assignment if I remember correctly, each color tile is also, color and texture tile are also four by four. So these are all perfect cubes. 
for the analysis portion of this interpretation. So sorry, critique for the analysis portion of this critique. I will start also with the textures again. Um, on the leftmost left side texture, it appears that this artist is using different um, thicknesses of cardboard and is rolling them up very thinly in order to create both a visual and actual texture. Um, on the very top of the leftmost cube, it appears to be maybe pasta um, that has been arranged and glued in a very interesting way. And on the right side of the left texture cube, um, these appear to be like gift tissue boxes, gift tissues um, all scrunched up and put together and laid out in an interesting way as well. On the bottom left texture, the very top, it appears to be dollops of silicon or hot glue. And then right below that on the left side is what appears to be colorful stuffing to be glued onto the side of the cube. And on the right side, it appears to be fake grass, um, the kind of materials that are usually used for landscapes or tiny terrariums, um, which are made of plastic or perhaps cardboard as well. On the right side of both of these pictures, I also see the colorful cubes. Um, the color cubes um, on the left side, on the top, it appears to be an analogous color scheme with the blue and the green and kind of like an in-between color of those two. And then on the right side of that, it appears to be a series of tints or um, another set of analogous colors. Um, they all flow very together, um, flow very evenly in between. This artist has also used different triangles and shapes to create interest for these. The top appears to be more of a gradient. And on the left side, it appears to be the same kind of design as the right side. However, this time with a um, maybe a monochrome color structure along with like the yellow. And then on the bottom color cube, I am seeing a monochrome with the yellow, dark yellow flowing into the light yellow. On the top, it is a complementary um, with the cyan and pink colors. They also appear to be different, um, different hues or different intensities of color. And then on the right side, it is all very brightly colored and it also appears to be an analogous color scheme. For the interpretation portion of this assignment, I really do feel like this artist has been having a lot of fun with this assignment. It all looks very visually pleasing. The um, texture cubes are very playful, very colorful. Um, even though the color was not the main portion of the texture cube assignment, they all look very interesting to work with and um, it invites the viewer to want to touch and play around with it a lot. Um, it is also very visually interactive and very visually appealing or um, playful. Same with the color cubes. The cube seems very playful, very interesting. Um, the complementary blue and pink side um, remind me a little bit of Monsters, Inc., like with the doors. Looks mm. very playful, something alluding to childhood maybe. And for the evaluation, I will say this assignment appears very successful. The cube seemed to be um, in the bounds of the assignment, the correct shape and the correct size. The colors are all displayed um, artistically and they all seem to be very carefully thought out. The textures are all incredibly different and overall this is a successful assignment. All right, excellent. I, again, this feels like it is, you wrote down uh, everything beforehand because there didn't feel to be a lot of pausing or anything like that. It, that's always interesting for me because as a listener, I think it's a lot more engaging or I'm not, I don't know if in, a lot more engaging is, is the right way to say it. It makes me feel like the person speaking uh, is really confident when it's you know formatted like this. I, I like it too when, when somebody's kind of feeling things out verbally, but it, it makes me feel very uh, like the, the person speaking is very confident when you're using notes and organizing your thoughts like that. This I think was a challenge to critique just because of how you had to, for each element to critique, you had to place it on the image as well. What do you think, Paula? What's your takeaway with this, this critique? And again, you're just critiquing the critique, not the object. 
Um, yeah, I think it was really impressive how uh, she was able to get through all the different elements because there's so many, um, especially without it feeling unorganized because um, it could have been because there's so much it could have been bouncing back and forth from a lot. But um, I feel like she's like, yeah, there was like focus throughout all of it, I guess. All right. Excellent. Thank you. And Diana, how did how did you uh, put this together? Thank you, Paula. How did you put this together? Uh, again, you did the notes and outline, I'm assuming? Yeah, I also did a notes and outline for this, um, but I also kind of like, um, my notes and outline for this one were a little different just because there were so many um, different things I wanted to get to. Um, so what I actually did in order to like, just in my brain know where I was looking and what I was critiquing at that time, I actually drew out the boxes and put like top right, left, right, just so I knew which one I was talking about. That's that's a really good idea. And it's it's funny because we don't normally think about that, but it makes perfect sense when you're critiquing the work. I, I think that that turned out really well. So these, the critiques are due, let's see, the critiques are due April 19th. And I think that you know whoever wants to turn it in uh, over Easter weekend, you'll still get extra credit points. That won't be a problem at all. Uh, and I'm wondering, maybe first week of April, we'll do extra credit too. And so you know, up up to April seventh, uh, everybody will get extra credit who wants to turn that in. Does that sound good with you guys? Okay. All right, good. Excellent. I have gone through everything that has been turned in so far has been graded. So, uh, and I think every, yeah, everything has been graded. So you should be able to see what those points are. A couple of things that I wanted to talk about as well before we get into the other stuff is first, under the last module that says final, there is a little section called student SRI. If you go to that, you get an extra two points. Uh, no, I'm sorry, you don't get an extra two points. You get an extra 2% over, on your overall grade. And that is usually enough if you are getting an A minus to give yourself a solid A. And I will add that into your grade at the very end of the term after everything else is put together. So that, as soon as that student SRI thing shows up so you can access it on your um, student uh, access page, then I would, I would recommend going ahead and, and doing that as soon as, you, as soon as you see it pop up. A couple of the other things I wanted to talk about are, uh, I was going th through and looking at the paper mache uh, what I'm impressed with, I have had, there has been some really bad paper mache over the, the last couple of years. There has been a, a couple where people just kind of looped the paper mache over their object and it ended up looking like, like some fourth graders doing a mummy costume for an elementary school play. I mean, it just looked really, really bad. I did not see any of that from any of you guys this year. I, I really appreciate that. Everybody was paying attention. If you didn't get full points, it's usually because uh, it wasn't sanded down and smooth. And so if that's the case, just go through and sand it down and smooth it out. The, next, the last stage that we're going to be doing with your card biomorphic abstraction is, and if the um, due date doesn't um, reflect this, then we'll fix it next week. But the, the last thing you're going to be doing sculpture wise is taking that and spending the last couple of weeks of the semester just going over it and adding color and texture using what you've learned from the color and texture cubes. This is successful when you add on to it, let it sit for a couple of days, 
and add on to it more and then do that several times. What I want you to do is add enough texture and color on this that it, it pretty much completely transforms your carved biomorphic abstraction. We will talk about this more next week. Uh, and for the rest of the term, we're going to be going over people's presentations as they turn them in. So, you know, um, and asking people to talk about the completion of their service learning projects and things like that. Do you guys have access on campus? Do you, are either of you able to get up on campus? Yeah, I'm on campus um, Monday through Thursday for like the morning. Because I believe Jason still has on display in our 3D design room several examples of this project from previous semesters. Keep in mind that the, the displays that he has are the, the examples that he has on display are all B level work. So, uh, you know, look and look at them. But I'm talking about when we're talking about adding texture and color, I'm talking about picking a color scheme that you want to work with and then just going out the wazoo and really working it on your object with the color. And then when you go to texture, I've had people texture it, texture their thing by gluing on like six buttons. If you're going to do buttons, glue them on, tighten up together and overlapping so it looks like scales. And do and the successful ones, the person uses at least three, four, or five textures, at least. One of the one of the cooler ones that I saw is somebody actually does uh, did cosplay and they were really good at making believable manes and tails, you know, animal tails like like horse tails and or fox tails. And what they did was make their object, and they also had a collection of old CDs that weren't any good anymore. So what they did is they smashed up the CDs. So they got all these really cool looking shards of that CD plastic. And they made a number of these small foxtail type things. And they put applied both of those as textural elements to their carved biomorphic abstraction. They did they added paint and they did other things too, but that was incredibly cool because it wasn't designed to look like an animal at all. They were just using that as really interesting visual texture. Some other ones that I've seen is where somebody actually uh, coated it with uh, shrink wrap, used a really hot hair dryer that melted most of the shrink wrap, then they spray painted it. They added other elements like um, hot glue strings and things like that. Then they uh, added other textural elements like the, the fake grass that you get for train sets. Then they added another layer of the shrink wrap, spray painted it, heated it up with a, a blow dryer. So it just it melted it, made it look all stringy and weird. And they just built up a texture with layers like that. And it looked incredibly cool and not a little spooky. So I, I want people to, to be thinking about that because that's that's the next big project to work on. And for everybody who has not turned in their conceptual works yet, which is the wrapped object and the, um, the ready-made, there's plenty of time to do that. Work on it, look at the other people's examples. For the ones where you're supposed to turn it in and then make three comments or make one comment each for three other students' work, a couple of people didn't get all the points because they still need to do a couple comments. So you know there, there's time to do that too. And a few people, and we'll, we'll look over this in, in just a little bit. A few people had really, really good ideas, but I think that it would be so much more cool to see uh, additional work put in, like more layers. Do you guys remember the looking at the artist, learning about the artist uh, Judith Scott from the background section for the uh, contemporary processes module? Yes, I do remember Judith Scott. 
what I absolutely love about her work is, you know, at a very young age, she was separated from her sister and put in a state run special home because she was developmentally challenged and she was deaf. Because she was developmentally challenged, nobody took the time to do proper tests to find out that she was deaf. They just assumed that she didn't want to respond. When her sister was finally able to locate her and find her, she was able to put her into a, a, a home where she could actually function independently, Judith Scott, and that created in her life a renaissance of creative activity that was just astounding. And so she started making these wrapped objects where she would go on walks and liberate little items that she found. So, you know, the rest of us in the world would probably call it stealing, <laughs> but she would liberate these little items like hair clips and combs and things like that. And then she would use yarn, rope, fabric that she would cut into strips to wrap these objects kind of like uh, talismans and mummy wrappings and develop these huge cocoon-like shapes with all these items inside. Her sister gave permission for people, for uh, galleries to start x-raying some of these items that Judith Scott had made. And that's when they started finding that inside there's all these little items that have been uh, developed. Yeah, definitely. She is definitely an icon. And then, you know, we, we look at uh, Jean-Claude and Christo, and it's amazing the, the work that they did with wrapping. And I hope you guys had a chance to, everybody had a chance to look at their website because there's a lot of really cool stuff that they would do where they would find a site, they would draw up uh, what they wanted to have done. And I, I think uh, Christo, spent a lot of energy making watercolors and acrylic paintings, kind of mapping out where the folds would be in the material, where the ropes would go, what color of ropes that he wanted to use, all that kind of stuff. And it, it just makes it a lot more interesting when you put that kind of thought into uh, the work that you do. And I, I'm, no, that's not the right way. All of you guys are putting that level of thought in. What I'm talking about is putting in the level of um, activity to support the level of thought that you put in. So I'm gonna go to the ready-mades thing. And we'll, I know that we spoke about several of these. We're just gonna look at them and I'll let you know what, what I kind of thought about it. Cause I like, the rationale, everybody's writing is really good, but the only thing that I'm I'm seeing is that I think that like the photos need to be revisited on just a couple of these. Now this one I think is excellent. It's called the watering hole. I think it's, it's an actual recontextualization of a, uh, an incredibly ubiquitous item. It's in almost everybody's refrigerator. On this, to tie in with the watering hole though, I think, now tell me what you guys think. I think that this would be, look, really, really cool. Set up outside on the top of one of those cement parking lot barriers or something where it feels like it's out in the middle of nowhere or in the middle of an urban landscape. I think that would be incredibly cool. And I think it would really underscore the title of the piece. What do you guys think? Yeah, I fully agree with that. I feel like um, just with a name like the watering hole, um, I feel like it could have been placed maybe like an outside setting or something more kind of like rough, tough type of setting. So um, just because also it would also contrast really nicely with like the really um, glossy and very like clean and uh, smooth Pyrex. And then having the background be very textured and very rough would also be very visually interesting. Yeah, I, I think so. I think that that would look really cool. So if this person wanted to do that, I'd say, you know, take, take it outside for a sec, set it up, photo take a couple photographs and see if you agree. Um, but I, I think that that would look really, really cool. 
And anytime like this, if you've already submitted to the discussion board and stuff like that, you don't have to resubmit to the discussion board unless you really want to. Um, but I'm saying, you know, for submitting it like this, it, it would be nice to, you know, revisit those and, and see what you think, or at least respond to, to what I was saying. I think this one turned out really good. I think Abby did a really good job with that, especially when we were able to talk to her about it. This is one of those, I think that this one is called Precious Cargo. And I, I, I really kind of liked that whole idea of recontextualizing it by putting it upside down. So you're, you're forced to look at it in a different way. And this one I think was a really good idea, but this one I think would look so much better setting it even on like um, if you, like a, a museum pedestal would be really, or something that looked like a museum pedestal would look really kind of neat. Or setting, putting it in a setting like that where it's on a very clean, pristine um, shelf, or maybe not even a, a pristine shelf. I, I think that one of the really cool things that would be is photographing this from the top. So you just see the circular hole because I think that that would fit with the title of this, I think is a candle holder. And I think that putting a teeny tiny tea, le tea light in the bottom and then taking a photo of this from the very top so it looks like a, um, a target would look exceptionally cool. I think that that would look, what do you think about something like that? Yeah, I think I kind of said the same thing last time we talked about this piece. Um, that like do it because it's supposed to be a candle holder. Um, I feel like you could really play around with like the photography aspect of this one, in which you light up the inside, but then keep the outside kind of dark and keep it at like a lower exposure, maybe. And I feel like that would make it like really um kind of more obvious or like more um artistically displayed and also make you think about the title a little bit more. Well, and I was just thinking as you were talking, another thought occurred to me, what about taking a photo of this in a dark room where it's upside down over like a tea light, you know, one of those battery powered tea lights. So you only see light coming from underneath around the room. I think that that would look really cool too. But I think anything that addressed that idea somehow would, would be very interesting or even setting it on the side and putting the can, um, a, one of those battery tea lights in on the side while it's laying down. You know, something like that would be very fascinating, I think. But yeah, I agree, I agree. Um, this one, the, the biggest issue with this one is that the file was did not come through with the photo. So if this person can, can resubmit, that, that would be great. This is one that we looked at and ended up liking because you can see the water pouring in and then the water immediately coming out, calling it faulty cup, it really turns out, goes together nicely. And I think we all talked about how much we enjoyed the, the many layers of this, feeling like it responds to um, Joseph's Kosa's, uh one in three chairs. And the cycle of life, I think we, we talked about that. That turned out pretty well. This one, this is called Anxiety's Fly Swatter. And I think this is a really successful photo. I think it's successful for, for a number of different reasons. I love how they set up the background with kind of a modified infinity screen. With, looks like with a, with a paint tarp or a, sheet, or a or a sheet, and I like how they were able to get this thing to stay in place. This photograph makes me think a lot more of Klaus um, Oldenburg's um, uh, Cherry Bridge. You know, he's and he's the guy that made like the the blow up plastic toilet and the gigantic. You know, it's called Spoon Bridge. 
where it has a, it's a bridge made out of a gigantic spoon with a huge cherry at one end. And th that's what makes, yeah, because, you know, the little hair tie there really challenges your ac acceptance of scale. I think that, that this is successful at a dramatic image. And this is one that I wanted to talk about a little bit, which I think it, it's not what we were, what I was expecting at all in seeing a, a ready-made. This is something where the person found an object that had all of these burnt in rings you know, being cooked and not then not cleaned thoroughly. And then, you know, used as a, a cooking implement again, not cleaning. And they took photos and collaged them together. And this becomes, I mean, this is something that would be fascinating as a poster sized image in a gallery. So the, the, the ready-made object is these burnt rings that they just found and photographed. So I, I think that this, push, this pushes that idea of the ready-made quite a bit. I think it pushes it in an interesting direction. So I'm trying to see if I can get it so that you can see the whole thing. Yeah. What do you guys think about this one? So this one actually makes me think of like stuff you see under a microscope. Yeah, it's How really onion rings nice. look under a microscope. Yeah, I find this really fascinating. This is really cool. And it is not at all. I almost asked him to redo this, but I I thought I I think it's really fascinating because this does fit with that ready-made idea. It's something that was found that you did not make. Typically, the ready-made has to be something that needs to be something that somebody else manufactured. But I think that this is the way that this was thought out and presented. I think it, it pretty well justifies itself. Would you concur? Oh yeah, I agree. It does feel a little more like graphic designy though, rather than like conceptual art. But I do think it fits fully within the ready-made thing. And it also fits in like to like the whole aspect of like rebellion with a whole conceptual art system. Right. Yeah. So I, I just think it's fascinating, but I, I think that this person should consider getting this printed really big and putting it in to one of the student shows. I think that would be really very cool. Oh, we saw this, the, the, the bento box. What do they call it? I forget what they, they titled it. Balance oh, balance proportions. proportions. That's right. Yeah. This is one of those things that would look very cool on a gigantic scale. Oh, yes. And we, we talked about this one. I really like the juxtaposition of this. I think it would be more successful with the, the fruit engaging with the McDonald's cut more. I remember us talking about that. So, you know, all in all, I, I'm really happy with people, what people have been doing with the, the ready-mades and conceptual art. And then I wanted to go, let's see, I wanted to visit the colorful cocoon or wrapped object. Uh, uh, there's still quite a few people that need to turn these in and please turn them in as soon as you can so we can look at them. And some of the new ones I think were, are, were really striking and I, I'd like to have you guys' take on them too. Like like this one, I I think this is really fascinating. This reminds me of if Judith Scott and Jacques Claude and Crystal had a baby, because you have the you know the the feminine icon 
there with you know looking like she's just gasping for air while she's smiling and then it there's all these ribbons wrapping around it and there's so many ribbons there's layer on layer on layer and the silhouette is completely different than what the Barbie doll would be by itself. I think that's absolutely fascinating. And it looks to me, it, it, it looked like it was, it's fun and chaotic, but I, it does not look like it would have been very fun to uh, clean up afterwards. <laughs> but I think this turned out really well. What do you guys think? I also feel like it's giving very like it it um feels very reminiscent of what Judith Scott did I feels a lot like I did watch a lot of videos um just kind of like of Judith Scott's process like they filmed a bunch of videos of her just working on her items um and working on her art and this feels very much like it looks like what she did um it looks like everything is bound together and it looks like everything is like being twisted and turned within each other and then I also feel like the ribbons and everything are a very good connection with like the Barbie doll in the center because one thing that um, kids like to do with Barbies a lot is just dress them up. So like the ribbons really tie that together. Yeah, I, I think it turned out really, I think it turned out really well. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I'm spacing off a little bit because I, I thought I had screwed up and stopped the recording, but we're still recording. Yeah, it, it, but it, it does remind me of that quite a bit. And I love the fact that there's all these little beads and all this other stuff in there, too. Oh, and this is one that we saw, we looked at last week uh, along similar lines. It reminds me of um, hoarders <laughs> when you see that. And this is one that, that's really fascinating to me that I think you know, it looks to me like there's there's two phones that are wrapped together. And I think that would be what would be so cool about this is doing another layer of plastic wrap, then another layer of ribbons or ropes or string, then another layer of plastic wrap, and then another layer of rope or string, doing several layers like that. I think that that would make this really very, very interesting. Because I think that this is an excellent start but with that idea of the cocooning, um, I, I it's always better, you know, when you start like this to do several more layers on it. I think that I think, and I think that that would really be fantastic. This person, of course, is, has most likely taken this wrapping off and done something else with their phones. But it would be easy to go back and revisit it, revisit this like that. And again, if, when I say stuff like this, and you want to redo it. You don't have to, unless you want to post it again on the discussion, you really don't need to do that. It would be fun for other people so that everybody else could see it. But again, you, you don't really need to. You just revisit it and um, send it in to me. Oh, yeah, that's right. This is one where the file that was sent in was blank. So this person, uh, before I can grade anything, needs to resubmit that. And sometimes that happens. What I am happy is uh, about is at the beginning, I asked people not to send me HEIC files because my computer wasn't good at deciphering them. And I, I don't see very many of those. I, uh, people have been listening, so I really appreciate that. Now, this is a fascinating take on this idea of wrapping. What I love about this is it is not what you're expecting. There is some rubber bands and stuff like that, but most of the wrapping are layers and layers of cloth that are closed pinned together. And I think that that's fascinating. What do you guys think about this one? Well, this one to me actually feels like very loving. Like it doesn't have any harsh creases and it all feels very gentle. Like even the rubber bands aren't fully digging into the fabric. Um, it just and also the way it was sc um, screenshotted, the way it was photographed from above, it's just it reads as very interesting to me, too. Yeah, I, I think it turned out really well. And some of the fabric like this, this lighter colored fabric reminds me very much of popular fabric styles in the 50s and early 60s. And so it reminds me of my grandma. 
Because <laughs> she, she loved wearing uh, jackets out of fabric very similar to this. And, you know, and stuff like that ties in with the overall feeling as well. Oh, yeah, th this is the one that you were working on. I think this one is really interesting. I have no idea what was underneath it. But this becomes just an interesting object by itself because of the material that was assembled around it as the wrapping. This would be something that would be very fascinating if it was like um, two feet tall. I mean, that, what can you tell us about it, Diana? Um, it's just like a stuffed animal I had and I just crocheted around it. And I think my favorite part about this is that I got to use the puff stitch, which is something I don't often use um, when I make garments, just because I don't like how it looks on me. Um, but it's a very fun stitch to make. I, you know, and, and sometimes as, a, as an artist, justifying your work just because the process was fun is perfectly fine justification. <laughs> I, I think that works out. I think this is a really interesting idea, too, because this is a book that just has layers and layers and layers of plastic wrap on it. And I was thinking something like this would be absolutely fascinating by doing something and, and like alternating layers or putting some other visual texture between the layers of the clear wrap. And I think I, I was I was suggesting like ribbon or string and then doing another layer of the clear plastic wrap and then another layer of, of ribbon or string. I think that, that would make it very interesting visually because one of the things that frustrates me in my own work is I get a really clear idea of what I need to do. And then when I accomplish it, it doesn't feel, it doesn't have the visual impact that I'm hoping for. And I think that by alternating layers of different texture and then, you know, and then in between doing more clear wrap, I think would really add a, a lot of that kind of engaging visual interest to this, I, I think is a really good start, but I, I think that could be very fascinating. Like even um, different bands, I mean, you can get different colors of, of clear wrap, but if you don't wanna do that, just even a couple different kinds of string, like maybe one layer of string is just basically straight lines going horizontally and vertically, and then another layer of, of clear wrap and then maybe the next layer of string is, is a contrasted color and they're all diagonal. I think that could be really interesting. I thought this one was really interesting too. And the reason why I think that this is Fascinating. It's just, it's clear wrap and it has a couple layers of ribbon on it. But by recontextualizing it and standing, you know, one piece on end, it makes it really visually rather interesting. If this person wanted to add another layer of, of clear wrap, another round of ribbon, that would make it even more cool, I think. But I like how the wrapping also kind of uh, echoes the color of the original object. And it's interesting to me that most of this, you can't see what it is, except for this one little lid area right there. This, we can tell what it is because of you know the context and we can see the spout right there. I really like the colors on this and the way that that's played with, I think is really interesting. And this one I think is, is really fascinating too. Where the object, I, it's hard to even tell what the original object is. And the person used a lot of yarn like webbing. And then it looks like they were also knitting and doing different things. And so I, th I think this is really fascinating. It becomes its own object. I mean, it, it does, no longer feels like it's a wrap to anything. What do you think? What do you guys think about this one?
Yeah, I can't. I can't even tell what what is the wrapped object. I don't even know what's in there. I can see a pencil maybe, um, but this is really interesting to me, especially like the webbing with the yarn. I would love to see like a video process of this happening because I feel like it'd be satisfying. Yeah, I, I think so. I think it's really fascinating, and I and I love. This is one of the reasons why I really enjoy teaching this class because you guys are all. I, I, te I also teach an introductory art class to a whole bunch of people that are completely uninterested, which is so draining and sad. And I really enjoy this class because all of you guys are professionals in your own right, and you really intelligently explore the themes that we're discussing. It's fascinating to see what you come up with. And usually if I say it would be interesting to, to do this or that or explore that theme or whatever, Almost all the time, the response I get is, yeah, that's a great idea. And then they come back with something that's even better. And I, I, I think that that's really fantastic and a lot of fun to see. I think that that is what I had on my list of things to cover, because we, we talked about all, those th all the things we needed to cover. Do you guys have any further questions? Um, I guess one my main question is for like the Voltron sculpture. Um, so I know our next step is to be adding texture and color. Is it like, how important is the color aspect of it? Like, are we able to keep it a monochrome color palette or, and like mainly focus on texture or does they, do they both have to be like equally balancing um, components of the artwork? Well, and, and that's kind of a, a tricky question. Because if your color scheme is going to be monochromatic, then color is going to be an important element to it. What I would say is this is not successful if the only color you add is in little daubs here and there. If you're going to do use a monochromatic color scheme, it is so much more interesting to, uh, one thing that I've seen is somebody cut, painted the whole thing one color, and then they painted shades, uh, you know, on overlapping um, dots or patches so that it looked like, you know, visually the color that was applied almost looked like um, really tight feathers. And that was really fascinating. And the, somebody else did a lot of texture with yarn and things like that, but all the texture that they used stayed within the same color scheme. So they used yarn that was in the same color scheme as what they'd used to paint with. One of the least successful ones that I've seen is somebody spray painted the whole thing gray and then just painted like eight circles of color around it. And that, that really doesn't do much. So I'd say if you're gonna do monochromatic, do shades of the same color and as much as you can do all the texture within that same color scheme as well. And I think that that could be really interesting. Or paint the object itself with monochromatic so that it's fascinating, not so that it's, you know, you don't want to do all the same flat color. You want it to be interesting. You want it to be different. Uh, and then have the texture be contrasting colors or other parts of the, the color scheme that you're working with. So th there's a couple of different ways that you could go. Did that help at all or did it make it worse? No, that was perfect. That explained what I had questions about, so thank you. Okay, all right, good. So I again- I too, sorry. Yeah, no problem. What's your question? As far as adding texture to the sculpture, um, do we want to avoid adding too much texture that we start losing the original shape or can we do as much as we want or more is better add texture until you think you're done then come back a couple days later and add more this you I, I want you just to put if you put so much texture on that you can't even see the original thing that is fine that's great 
as you're doing this though, be, be also, also be mindful of the color scheme that you're using so that your texture reflects the color scheme that you've chosen. So yeah, put as much texture on as you can and then add more. Does that help? Yes, that helps. Okay. Because what I'm going to do is, um, it says they're due on the 9th. I, I don't think that that's gonna be good. What, what we'll do is we'll talk about it more Tuesday the 2nd and um, we may add more time to it at that point. Because uh, if, if, for example, when you did your biomorphic abstraction, it wasn't smooth or rounded enough, or you need more time to sand your paper mache down or anything like that, get that part done uh, where you need to have it first. And then next week, we will just talk about applying color and texture out the wazoo and more. So we, yeah, we want to do as much as we can. And the two other things, I, or the three other things I want to address is, if you have a zero on any assignment, look and see what it is and then resubmit it. And sometimes you get a zero for an assignment that was submitted because the file was blank or the wrong assignment was, was submitted. So look at the comments. And if you don't agree with the comments, it may be sometimes I am grading at like 2.30 in the morning and I have gotten some really angry comments from people because I was actually grading and writing responses for somebody else's assignment. And it made no sense at all. And that was because I was doing it at 2.30 in the morning. So um, you let if you don't agree with what I said, let me know. I, I have had that happen in a couple of the quizzes where the person was just wrong and trying to, and trying to tell me that they were right, but um, that, that wasn't the case. But I have had several people tell me, well, I, you know, you, you missed this because you didn't see it from this angle. So, you know, here's that missing photo. And then I say, oh yeah, okay, so you did do that. And they've gotten the points. But you can resubmit, rework, resubmit, you know, as many times as you need to. Several people on uh, this most recent quiz missed between one and three points. And you can uh, redo that. So you get perfect points if, if you want to. I heartily recommend that everybody go through the annotated bibliography and revisit that and so that you can you know, re-edit what I, what I suggest and resubmit so you can get the, the perfect points on that. And then also on, on the discussions, if it calls for a response that's missing, just go ahead and email me as soon as you add the remaining parts of the discussion so that you can get the full points there. And I think that that is, oh yes. And the last thing is I want to remind people that um, you can still turn in for extra credit points, your peer and self-critique videos up to uh, next weekend. So that's April 7th and you'll get extra credit. I Only three people have done these so far. So there's 16 left, uh, 16 people who still need to do them. Get them done as soon as you can, and that's one less thing to worry about those last two or three weeks of the semester. All right? Okay, that is all that I have. So, um, all right, good, both of you. So if you guys have, do you, are there any remaining questions or are we good? All right, both of you are good. Okay, excellent. Then uh, we are gonna wind it up for tonight and I will look forward to seeing you guys next Tuesday. You guys have a really safe Easter weekend. This is not a weekend that most people go out and uh, party really super hard, but there will be a lot of people on the road that perhaps haven't driven for 20 or 30 years. So be really careful when you're out and about, all right? And you guys have a good weekend, be safe. I look forward to seeing you next Tuesday. All right. We'll see you guys. Sweet. See you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Bye. You're welcome. We'll see you.